Intel has put out there, uh, and a lot of this is open source or um, freeware that you can download and, and use in your environments and, or put together environments. We start at that Xeon stack, the Xeon la uh, layer, and then we add the MKL on top of that, the math kernel library. We're trying to make the most use out of the Intel architecture as we can. We take that and we extend that using the DAL or the uh, Data Analytics Acceleration Library, uh, which is at the layer that, we, uh, that we're familiar with uh, MLLive or GraphX or Spark, uh, uh, working, working in that layer. Above that, you've got big data with uh, several of the things that are going on with um, Hadoop, uh, Cloudera, uh, Apache, Hadoop, uh, Hortonworks, MapR. Uh, and then you have the cloud uh, people coming into there and putting this all on the cloud. You've got Microsoft, Amazon, and some others. And then you look at the high performance computing arena with the Omni fabric and what we're doing there. Today, really, we want to hit a three, la three layers and how these things working together are going to help you accelerate your performance. So at the MKL level, um, we'll have, we'll have Zhang Zhang talk a little bit about that. Uh, as, as he's talking about the DAO. I want to give you a little bit more on the analytics toolkit and what we're bringing. So with all these tools that we're creating are complementary and pretty seamless and they go together really nicely. What uh, the DAO is doing is looking at extending uh, and increasing performance in MLLive. Uh, we've actually contributed back to MLLive some, some algorithm, algorithmic work. Uh, we've actually contributed to GraphX, uh, we've contributed to Giraffe, uh, and to Mahout. So we're actually trying to, to move this, this arena as much as possible. So the DAO itself is bringing optimized algorithms, um, optimized based on MKL. And it brings together a serialization as well, so you can do distributed, uh, run this in a distributed system, as well as just on a standalone type machine. Um, so it brings together some of the building blocks also that uh, are what we see in the pipeline. And I'll show you the pipeline in a minute and how, how the toolkit helps you achieve the different things that you need to, need to, to do as a data scientist um, to, to get your answers. We really want to advance and make as easy as possible the experience you have as a data scientist in getting results, turning that data into results and insight. So we do uh, a little bit of extraction, transformation, loading. Uh, we do graph algorithms that are in the, in the system already. Uh, you might see things like LDA um, in there. You'll see SVM, you'll see um, CGA, conjugated gradient descent um, in the system as well. Uh, we've, uh, we've really looked at how we're going to move forward with graph algorithms and graph uh, and pushing graph data so that we're not dealing with just um, embarrassingly parallel data uh, in the system, which is something that Hadoop has done very well. So we're, we're actually looking to see how we can make use of some of the things that Spark is bringing forth and uh, looking at our plug-in framework. Uh, that, we, that we're going to lay out, or that we have laid out, and open source today. So when you look at the, uh, the analytics toolkit, you should look at it as a unifying pipeline. Uh, from ex data extraction, on the next slide, from ingestion and cleaning, engineering features, building graph or doing basic analysis, visualization query, and then going into uh, running graph and, um, or machine learning algorithms to get that insight. insult. When you bring the DAO into this, it actually brings algorithms at the different levels um, or different um, areas of the pipeline. So they've got compression and outlier detection for ingestion and cleaning. There's uh, PCA with feature engineering. There's summary statistics. And then there's model and decision making. Okay. I want to show you a little bit of a demo. I'm going to a demo of uh, the ATK right now, and then I'll actually run um, the DAO algorithm based, based on that. Okay. So the ATK, the analytics toolkit, 
can have any front end on it you'd like, whether it's Eclipse, IntelliJ, or IPython. I'm using IPython mainly for the projection. I, normally in my day-to-day, -day, I use IntelliJ. So I actually ported all these into IPython so you, so you can see what they are and what they're doing. Some of the important parts of this are you want to Im import the analytics toolkit, which is actually down here. Let me bring that up. The analytics toolkit, so really what you need to do is you need to import the analytics toolkit, AT, uh, I call it Trusted Analytics, that's ATK. Um, make sure you connect to that server, and then we're going to build a data frame. Okay. So to build a data frame, and what a data frame is, data frames, uh, the way the ATK defines data fit frames, is it's taken the RDD from Spark, and we've actually advanced it. Uh, and we've added a lot of um, intelligence to it. Um, it's immutable, but we've got extra features and methods that we have added to it. And if you go and look at the code, you'll, you'll be able to see that. So we want to take that data frame and we want to tell it what we're going to do. We're going to take a data set, read in the data set, uh, tell what the schema is, and create the frame. So RDDs are immutable, and that's important. So uh, it's important to know that we will read in that CSV file and create the frame. So that's what's going on here. It actually reads the frame in. This is a lot of data, so I'm not gonna we're not gonna actually run this script. I'm gonna run the next script that I show you. Okay. And we're gonna do some ETL on this data frame, drop row functionality. Um, I like to do timings and get some timings, so I actually put import a timer as well to see how, how long these things are going to take. In here, so doing drop row functionality on the frame is pretty simple. You can actually do frame.filter, uh, do a pi lambda, and uh, give me the rows, not 18, and print that information out. I've actually done it a couple of ways here to print the information out. A little further. So there's just a, a, a line that went down pretty far. Um, I've actually done where I actually um, did some formatting, so got some formatted output and also got some, some output just paging through the data. So it lets you page through the data pretty simply as well. Then you can take your frame if you want and download it to Pandas so you can actually do any local analysis on it. I've actually downloaded about 200 rows locally just so I wanted to look at that in Pandas and see exactly how I was going to use that. Then I ran CGD, so I created a model. And ran CGD on this, and uh, if you can move the bar to the left a little, be fine. Thanks. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually run CGG and train the model. So CGG is a collaborative filtering algorithm. So it's part of our collaborative filtering models. So we actually tell it we're going to create an ATK collaborative filtering model, and then we tell it which one we want to we're going to train this model on. And we, we tell it that right there on the right hand side. We say we're going to run a CGB on this one. So it'll actually create the model, train the model using the data that was read in, and then we want to get a recommendation. CGG is a good recommending algorithm. Um, we'll do that with CGG. We'll do that with ALS as well. So run this, get a recommendation out of it. So it runs all of those steps, and then it comes back with your recommendation, you know, based upon the movies you've seen you get that information back. You can use the same RDDs that you did when you read the frame in to run multiple algorithms, right? I'm doing it in the same script, but I'm also going to do it uh, when I add the DAL to this and want to get some more information. 
So here, I'm running ALS, alternating squares, uh, against the same data, against the same, uh, creating another model. I'll call this one the ALS model, and then run uh, the algorithm against that. And there's the output from that. If you actually, the important part here is that because these algorithms are different, one is actually a little bit, does a little bit better uh, with this data. So it actually gives me a different set of movie recommendations. I thought that was pretty important as I was going through it. I can then take that data because it is um, movie recommendations and people recommending movies and create a graph with it. So here I, I'm actually creating a graph uh, using parquet file format in HDFS. And then I will take that graph. So uh, to define a graph using parquet, parquet format, we actually um, have a data frame that we create for vertexes and a, ver a data frame for edges. I can actually take that if I want, and I can export it to Titan. Uh, and then I can do work with Titan um, if there's anything I want to do with querying of the graph, uh, Titan on HBase or Titan on Cassandra, if I want to do any um, querying of the graph. So in here, I just did some graph inspections. I didn't export it. I just want to see it internally. Show me what the left vertexes look like. Show me what the right vertexes look like. So on the left vertexes, you see the users. On the right vertex, you see the, the movie recommendations. Um, the user names have you know, all been changed, but the movies are the actual recommendations. And then we talk about the edges in there as well. One of the things that the ATK does give you that's really interesting is it's um, is IntelliSense, you can actually uh, bring up at any level what's available to you. And there's extensive documentation on this as well. If you go out to the GitHub, you'll see that. Um, and we'll have those links at the end of the presentation for you. But it shows you all the different things you can do in here. Um, you can create a JSON file, export to JSON, export to CXV, C, um, CSV, export to Hive. Um, it's got all of that built into it. I can create a live SVN model. I can create a k-means model. Um, I can do linear regression, logistic regression. Uh, just um, it, it's making available and easy to use for the for you, the data scientist. Uh, so you uh, cut down that eighty percent of what your normal daily job is, and trying to make that a lot easier for you. So really quick, I want to run the DAO and show you what creating a DAO model would look like. So here I'm just going to take that same movie frame. Say I wanted to know the average, um, the average rating of a movie. Does the, does the average rating of a movie increase the more the movie is viewed? Mentally, in my mind, I would say yes it is because people are talking to other people about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this script right here. Should go through pretty quick. So right here, I'm just performing counts and averages. So here, I'm actually taking the data, starting to do my feature engineering with it a little bit, getting my averages and counts out. So I went too far. It's going pretty quick. So then, I'm actually creating a model using the DAO linear regression and training the model. So that's what those two lines are doing for me. Then I'm going to run the predict function. And the DAO itself is being run as a plugin to the ATK. Every command in the ATK is actually built as a plugin. So it all works, um, everything works. And so we've optimized our plugin engine to give you the best performance for plugins. So even as in the developer community, you can add plugins to this system and we have a class launcher so that we actually avoid conflicts in classes, even if things are named the same. So then at the end of this, so this ran all the way through, and it's going to give me a scatter plot showing me that yes, indeed, over time, the number of ratings. The number of times the movie has been rated, the actually the higher the movie rating goes, which is what I expected. So now I'm going to let John come talk a little bit about the DAO itself. All right. Um, thank you, Fred. 
So uh, I'm Jean, and uh, Fred, in his talk, he mentioned Analytics Toolkit, ATK, from Intel, which is a high-level tool that helps people to uh, do a lot of machine learning algorithms, a lot of work done quickly. But what is the workforce behind the scene? What is the, the uh, when, when those algorithms, when they need some compute-intensive tasks, tasks to be done, what they use. So Fred, if we remember the pipeline he mentioned early on, he associated a name with each stage of the pipeline, Intel DAO. What is it? So I'm happy to have this opportunity today to introduce a new library called Intel Data Analytics Acceleration Library, or Intel DAO. This is the workhorse behind the scene. It is a library that comes with a bunch of highly optimized built-in blocks that people can directly use in their machine learning, data mining, predictive analysis, all kinds of these workloads. And we see that, uh, again, I have a uh, pipeline here. Uh, this is a typical pipeline we see for all kinds of data analytics workload. Uh, from pre data pre-processing, transformation, <coughs> to analysis, modeling, prediction, etc. So the pur purpose of DAO is to provide something to help people in each stage. We strive to provide the most commonly used, most basic algorithms to help each of the stage. Um, and so take a we're just, we just taking a peek into this library at this time. Uh, what it has, what it has to offer. First, it is a library. In our first, in our initial release, comes with C++ and the Java interface. Maybe more other uh, high-level programming language support are in work, but that, that's, that's going to be in the future. Um, and one key point of this library is it is the, it is the only library out there of this kind that is specifically optimized for Intel architecture. Uh, it has a bunch of flexible connectors or interfaces allowing people to connect to all kinds of data sources. So you can uh, pump in data from HDFS, from SQL database, or even from just a uh, regular plain file uh, or some in-memory stream. You can read data from different sources. Um, and it has a flexible processing models to handle different situations. For example, the first situation is batch processing. This is the simplest way. Um, you just keep collecting your data, augment your data, and at the end, maybe your data is not so big, it fits in the memory of a single node, then job is easy. You just pick one algorithm and call the function, apply the function to the data, get results, so that's batch. But other times, maybe you don't know uh, when the data is, is going to end. Maybe the data is streaming in. Maybe you have huge data stored on storage, so you have to process it block by block. In that situation, we have something called online processing support, also called streaming processing. So it uh, allows you to uh, process piece by piece, and for each piece you get partial results at the end, and uh, there is a protocol. If you follow at the end, you can combine all the partial results and to make sense for the final results. So this is streaming. Uh, the third processing model is distributed processing mode. This is where we have a cluster at our disposal, either a traditional MPI cluster or Hadoop cluster or Spark environment. So in that case, uh, DAO supports a protocol very similar to MapReduce. So you have a bunch of slave processes that, that process local data and get partial results. And at the end, the master process does a combination or reduction to make sense out of it. So uh, the cool thing is DAO is not tied to any cluster platform. It's not tied to MPI. It's not tied to Hadoop. It's, it works for all of them because it only provides a protocol, a set of protocols for you to uh, compute partial results, uh, keeping track of partial results, and combining partial results. Okay. Um, 
Next slide. And so what algorithms we have at this time? In our initial release, as I basic and the commonly used algorithms, we have something very, uh, we start with something, something simple, like those basic statistics for your data sets, low order moments, quantiles. We also have uh, a few matrix factorization routines because a lot of times the algorithms are built on top of matrix factorization. Um, we have some analysis uh, functionality, for example, to compute correlation distance using either cosine distance or correlation distance. We have uh, data transformation or feature engineering uh, support. Right now, we only have PCA principal component analysis in this area. Uh, additionally, we have outlier detection using univariate or multivariate. We also have something called association rule mining, aka short card mining. There are a lot of algorithm out there, but in our, in our initial release, we provide only one a priori for association rules uh, mining. You notice that uh, there is a code col uh, color coding coming on, uh, taking place here. So what that means? So for all of those boxes, those algorithms colored green, those are the algorithms that support all three processing modes I just mentioned, batch processing, streaming, uh, or online processing, and distributed processing, right? Uh, others, the, the white ones, they support only batch at this, at this time, but we definitely were working on to give more support for distributed processing and uh, streaming. So those are a bunch of uh, uh, pretty straightforward or basic set of algorithms. Uh, on top of that, we also have some commonly used algorithms for machine learning uh, in the areas, for example, supervised learning, regression, and classification. For regression, at this moment, we have only linear regression, which was demoed in Fred's uh, uh, movie example. And we're also going to have decision trees for regression. And for classification, we have a little bit more to offer. Uh, we started with naive Bayes model, very, very, very basic and widely used. And we also have SVM, support vector machine, and a bunch of uh, boosting algorithms that you can use, users can use to, to build a stronger classifier by assembling a bunch of weak learners. In the area of unsupervised learning, we have basically just two clustering technologies, two clustering uh, methods, K-means and EM for GMM. Uh, and one thing I want to point out is we are putting in a prototype for alternating least square algorithm, also mentioned by Fred in his uh, demo. Uh, this is not going to be on the first release, but in next immediate next update, update release, we are going to to incorporate it uh, officially in our product. And the prototype, although it is just a prototype today, but it it, it, it is already working fine, working wonderfully. And after me, uh, Vikram is going to talk about a customer use case from Capital One. And that use case uses exactly this alternating, this square algorithm, and plus something uh, else from Intel libraries. Um, so that's DAO, very quick overview of DAO. Um, so DAO is a new library. Um, it's going to be available pretty soon for, for everyone. Uh, today we're just taking a peek into it. But in addition to DAO, I also want to mention MKL. Right? DAO is a library specifically designed for data analytics. But a lot of data analytics actually requires hard code math computing underneath. And for that area, we have math kernel library. DAO actually came out from the same team that uh, gave us uh, MKL. So we are pretty confident they are equally high efficient, high performance, and high quality. So just a reminder what MKL is. MKL is a math kernel library with uh, uh, rich functionality in multiple areas, linear algebra, FFT, vector math, uh, random number generation, statistics, and a lot more. And the DAO specifically uses uh, linear algebra functionality uh, very heavily and also a lot of functions from statistics. 
So just I uh, want to let people know that we have multiple libraries to handle different kinds of needs and different kinds of uh, requirements. And uh, uh, after my talk, Vikram is also going to say something about MKL and how this is also used in the case study. Vikram. Thanks, Sean. So what I'm going to talk about is a specific use case that you're working with Capital One. Now, uh, just to connect sort of the dots, our vice president this morning uh, introduced w why the importance of recommendation engine is needed in some of the organizations. Uh, I think the, you saw a person from JD.com and then also from Data Robot talking about performance, talking about recommendation engines. And that's because these algorithms actually help organizations, just like Capital One, uh, improve their um, uh, and grow their business. So let's talk about a special use case of collaborative filtering and what's, uh, what Jan just in, call, in, introduced as alternating least squared algorithm. So essentially, if you, and, and something that if some of you attended this morning's uh, uh, Intel Fellows talk, the Dubai's talk, who talked about various algorithms. Uh, one of one of the he mentioned was this, also was ALS and how ALS is actually used for recommendation. Essentially, what happens is, um, as you can see, there's a there's a uh, uh, there's a matrix of users and products, and as you know interest from Capital One, there's a large, extremely large number of users, extremely large number of products. And you could have like 60 million users or 10 million products or features that they want to rate. And this is just an example of, you know, whether, how would you rate movies or how would you rate books or how would you rate YouTube? Um, now, the interest is to find similarity is in users that actually would find something that this user doesn't, you know, how, how can we predict the rating for this specific user? So what is it? What happens? So you s essentially, ALS tries to factorize that matrix into, into a sm smaller matrix, which is called rank K, or K is the dimension of, as you can see, U by K, and a P matrix, which is K by P, so that's the transpose such that the product of those two matrices actually give you the ratings of that larger matrix. And you do it alternatingly because you start with my one matrix with a with a essentially random numbers or anything, and and then you try to fill that, and then you conversely go from P to Q and Q to R. Uh, um, so that's, that's the process of alternating, and the multiple iterations are used in ALS. So um, the use case here is, you know, we need to be able to train, develop the model, and then run it and run prediction on on set of data. In Capital One's use case, it was how can we uh, run this all and determine all predictions as fast as possible. So how does so what happens is this is the typical um, um, equation for ALS. And as you can see, the numbers will change over time as you run these algorithms. And if you want to do the predictions of these, then uh, what happens, as you can see, is that slowly that ones and zeros will change based on on this small, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, like six, eight by two and two by eight matrices. That just as an example. So what, the interest here is to actually to determine what sort of ratings we can predict for the user. So that's that's the, and the, the other thing is the interest is how, so there's a cost of training the model, how long would it take, there's a cost of predict, doing all predictions, and how fast can you actually predict, it, or the rate of prediction. So, so for that, we actually, um, so let me tell you the, the use case. So here we used 10 million users, Six, uh, excuse me, 60 million users and 10 million uh, products and a total rating of 1 billion and with about 20 iterations which is typical for ALS. Um, so you start with non-zero non ratings which is 
So it's a very sparse matrix because the non-zero is a very, you know, it's a very sparse matrix. But as time goes along, that actually that starts printing up, and then you can actually the memory size starts uh, significantly increase. So the computation, the, the training part, the training part computation essentially is n k squared. Okay, uh, st storage is about k squared. K also known as the rank or the factor. That's the the, the, the matrix size that we saw, that's the 2 in that example. Uh, it's compute intensive, however it's also IO intensive and there's, because I, I, I'll tell you what actually happens in, in, in each of those um, cases. And then prediction is on the other hand is actually is highly parallel, highly vectorizable and, and it's essentially is a dot product and multi-threaded. So, and that's we want to exploit and see how we can actually improve performance. Um, in Capital One's case, it was to do all predictions. Some some organization want online predictions, so you want to be able to predict what you're browsing through and be able to do give you ratings for products that uh, uh, give uh, or targeted ads for you based on your preferences that are matched to other users' preferences. So, for that, for this proof of concept, we worked with Cloudera and, and Capital One and actually used um, a, uh, our cluster, a Spark cluster. We actually used the most recent version of Spark, which is 1.4, uh, which is a large scale engine for parallel uh, computing and data processing. Um, the cluster is a nine node cluster, it's a Xeon E5-2699. One of the things that here is that it has 72 cores uh, per system, per node. So you have essentially 384 uh, cores available. Um, also, the, given the memory size for that problem set, we actually worked with like 256 gigabyte per node. Um, we need IO bandwidth, we need, because that actually helps improve performance, uh, we actually use 24 one terabyte SATA drive. Um, everything is over, um, you know, 10 gigabit Ethernet fabric because we can actually see that it uses much more than one gigabit, and so uh, 10 gigabit at least for this problem size works. For larger data set, one may actually need larger, um, a faster fabric. So this provides a sort of an ideal platform. What we a Xeon-based platform for for doing such kind of machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, so, so what are some other lessons learned from on this optimization? Um, some of the optimization you have to optimize at an application level, which is at the ALS level, because there are certain parameters that you want to actually uh, give to ALS that actually helps uh, perform better. And so, these are some of the optimization at the application level. You have to configure Spark so that you can actually uh, either extend that to larger data sets or actually perform and perform better. And so in this case, we actually st stand alone um, and we actually gave our 192 gigabytes. So here is the, uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with Spark, um, larger, having larger memory size causes garbage collection issues because you know, Spark essentially is JVM based. Um, however, larger problem size also requires you to have large memory. So they, and, and then there's so there's this uh, trade-offs for how do you account, how do you take care of the garbage collection? So there are some optimizations that we actually actually apply. Um, so as you can see, one of the uh, uh, one of the optimizations that we did was a Spark local directory in Spark, which actually if you you, the default case is you essentially point to slash temp wherever the slash temp is. Now slash temp may be on a hard drive or maybe on an SSD. However, actually if you have SSD that actually helps significantly. And you can, uh, in Spark Local DIR, you can actually specify multiple directories in Spark 1.4. And so you can actually do writes to Spark as it shuffles data. Um, serializer, deserializer is another aspect of Spark that we actually help, that helps. Um, there is default parallelism that needs to be set. 
So one other uh, aspect is speculation, why enable speculation? Because in Spark what happens is there are always stragglers that actually lag behind, so they actually hold the algorithm when, you know, because they say essentially want to complete, all, all tasks must, com must complete. So the stragglers actually hold other, the, 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 the completion. So speculation actually allows you to actually uh, rectify some of that, but uh, so this is some of this, this work is still going on in the Spark community. Uh, and so uh, the other things that we did was increase memory fraction depending size of the memory you have, and also for storage, we at the cost of decreasing storage memory fraction. For garbage collection, the basic ones are you know is the young GC and G1 GC. Uh, however, there are other as the garbage collection that we can apply. And if you need to know more about garbage collection tuning, you can actually go to a, the paper from Intel on Spark Summit that was presented at just in this March 2015. So let's see what uh, what we get from this all these optimizations. So as I said, there's a training and, and there's a prediction. So let, let's focus on the training aspect first. And so we, we ran this compared to a, some basic optimization is in, in standard ML lib ALS base. So what we call baseline because of course we gave it all the 72 cores per node, uh, we gave the memory size, we gave initial garbage collection. But on top of that we applied some more optimizations and we actually were able to pretty much get about 30% improvement. Um, so and and you, so so the if you if you if you do not apply all these three, even to base the base would look uh, really uh, it takes a really long time and so you know you have to do some initial level of so that's for the baseline so that's what we compared to the baseline. Um, also, we looked at how does it how does the performance improve over the data set size? Okay. Uh, looked at from 500 million to 1 billion to 2 billion and as you can see that the data sets actually scales fairly well. The iteration wise, the, the more number of iterations you have, the, the, the better the prediction that you can actually generate and so the accuracy improves, the accuracy of the model improves um, and so you, so and the, it scales. So. Uh, both cases in, in uh, uh, you have sort of a linear data set scalability and accuracy. So that was the training part. Training part has, still has challenges and that's something we want to address with our DAO library that Chang just talked about. Let's look at the prediction part. Prediction part, so if you, if you see 30% on training, uh, then you ain't seen nothing yet in a sense. So let's see. So what does prediction do? Uh, so we actually said, okay, for prediction, we want to predict to all 10 billion and all predictions. Okay. Um, we measured with and without data prep time because one is compute and other is data preparation plus compute. So in prediction, what happened is, as I said earlier in the slide, that it's essentially a dot product. It's parallelized and misthreadable and can effectively use AVX instructions in Xeon 2699. So we actually did use the ML baseline, how it performs, and then we extended that using something we call block mode support. And more importantly, the, this proof of concept actually involved, we did a native through uh, Java native interface. We made efficient use of the math kernel library. Second, um, we use the AVX instructions. Third, exploit cache locality. And of course, we use the 72 cores per node um, um, uh, in the cluster. And as we said, the data was optimally prepared and, and partitioned and placed. Now, so, so what do we see? So here we show for from on a small data set size of, 
of prediction for 100 million ratings. We can get something in the 57 for double, uh, single precision and, um, um, and, and for double precision. So about 57x compared to ML. Now, if you look at a larger data set size, we can actually, uh, here it actually fails, the MLLib actually fails, it cannot handle. When we went to the block size, it actually could handle that. And we actually get about 407 to 51x performance improvement. This is not percentage, it's actually x. So it's actually, you can multiply that by 100, but get the percent. So, so we said, okay, so that was compute only. So we said, okay, that one would say, okay, well, what about data prep time? So we actually added the overhead and included the data prep time as well. And for that, we actually get still get a you know 14x performance on small data sets and about 215x on on large data sets. So that's that's where uh, I'm going to say, okay, what is the cost of all this for this Java na you know a native interface to C code or to Java code? And so that's the cost. So of course, we use MKL library we, with 20 lines of C code, or 67 lines of Java code, and 36 lines of Scala code. That's what you can actually achieve. And that's a significant importance to Capital One because that enables them to, something that they could do in uh, days can be done in now hours and minutes, and that's important for, uh, for our customer. So, Native support in ALS using AVX instructions and MKL can really speed up performance. Now we want to take this and we are, as earlier Zhang indicated, to DAO. Uh, the ALS is not yet implemented, but we actually want to take this and actually uh, in future releases of uh, Intel's data analytics um, acceleration library, we want to include that in, in DAO and that would actually get you that kind of performance. So that's that sort of is the sort of the um, um, performance that we are seeing with with uh, ALS for Capital One. Now, you know, there are organizations that actually can benefit from from this and other algorithms, and we want to extend this some of these this work to other algorithms as well. Um,